afternoon. Welcome to the National Center on Sexual Exploitation's Confronting Sexual Exploitation Summer Seminar Series. Talk about a tongue twister. <laughs> and welcome to those who are watching online. The National Center on Sexual Exploitation is a nonprofit that was founded in 1962. It's the leading organization addressing the public health crisis of pornography and exposing the links between all forms of sexual exploitation. Nicosi operates on the cutting edge of policy activism to combat corporate and government policies that foster exploitation, advance public education and empowerment, and galvanize united action by spearheading the International Coalition to End Sexual Exploitation. To learn more about Nicosi's work, you can go to endsexualexploitation.org. Today, in the third part of our seven-part summer seminar series, We'll continue with a look at the public health harms of pornography. Here to speak with us today is Haley Halverson, our Director of Communications. So how, please welcome Haley Halverson. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thank you to all of you who came and are recognizing that this is an important issue that we need to talk about. Um, as Lisa said, we're the National Center on Sexual Exploitation. And to start off, I would like us all to just take a moment and imagine a world where cigarettes are completely normal, where celebrities talk about how cool it is to smoke, where doctors say that it's actually healthy for you, and where children are regularly given cigarettes, sometimes even in school. Well, I hope that by the end of today's presentation, you'll agree with me that pornography is as harmful to public health, if not more so, than cigarettes. To talking about pornography, it's important to define our terms. Um, this is not a legal definition, but what I have on the screen is pulled from a variety of different Webster's Dictionary definitions. In general, pornography is a depiction in writing, picture, or video that depicts erotic behavior and is designed to cause sexual excitement. Today, I'm not talking about the Sports Illustrated swimsuit cover, and I'm not talking about Carl's Jr.'s um, commercials. I'm talking about clearly recognized pornography. So what is a public health crisis? This is something else that there's not really a clear consensus on the definition. The CDC says that it's a problem that is cause for immediate concern and action. World the World Health Organization says that it's a serious problem that needs to be addressed. They're very vague definitions. So I would like to offer what's actually a more, more intense definition. I would define a public health crisis as a serious, harmful problem that affects individuals or groups beyond their capacity alone to correct. This includes both health and social issues, which is in line with previous public health work, such as on anti-bullying campaigns, or anti-suicide campaigns. And so is pornography a serious problem that is in fact affecting individuals and groups beyond their capacity alone to correct? Dr. Gail Dines, the founder of Culture Reframed, is a feminist activist who said it best when she said that we're in the midst of a social experiment that is reshaping the lives of young people all over the globe. We need to recognize that the pornography industry is not in this business to empower women. It's not in this business to be a champion of free speech. It's in this business to make money, and they're very good at it. In 2015 alone, one pornography website had over 87 billion video views. And so we are seeing that this is a global problem and that pornography production is pervasive. We also see that it's harming people at an at alarming rate. We had a call recently into our organization from a mother who was looking for some video games that were age appropriate with her daughter. She was on the web online looking for these video games and they were still exposed to pornography. This mother was doing everything right. She was trying to take an active part in her child's online experience and she was looking for age appropriate materials, but she couldn't stop them from being exposed. I also recently went to an event um, that was a religious conference with over a thousand pastors. And at one point, someone at the front of the conference asked everyone in the room to raise their hand if they had ever seriously struggled with pornography. Every single hand was raised except for one. 
So I went and found that guy because I wanted to know, what's your secret? How did you, out of this room of a thousand pastors, how are you the only one that hasn't seriously struggled with pornography? And I asked him and he said that he was raised by missionaries in a third world country and didn't have regular access to the internet until he was in his late 20s. In our culture today, it is impossible to escape the harms of pornography or to escape from being exposed to pornography. And we hear from so many boys who are having these experiences, 17 years old who said that it's controlling their life, taking over their time, 14 year olds who are saying that they can't even focus at school because it's all that they can think about. So we see that pornography is beyond the ability for any one individual to um, correct. And then we also need to recognize, is this a harmful substance? And so today we're going to look at the harms of pornography on the brain, the body, and sexual violence. And recognizing the fact that anecdotal research and peer-reviewed research is showing that these are serious harms. Starting with the brain, um, there, since 2009 there have been 30 neurological studies and 40 peer-reviewed research articles that have shown that pornography does have um, addictive qualities and it has negative impacts on the user's brain structure and function. Now when we get into the neurological research, it can get a little bit complicated. So I would give you three guide marks to remember. That pornography changes the brain, pornography conditions the brain, and pornog <coughs> pornography makes the brain susceptible to addiction or compulsive use. Your brain doesn't stop changing when you grow up. As um, recognized here by the Journal of Nature Neuroscience, the brain is the source of our behavior, but behavior also shapes the brain. S learning sculpts the brain. This has been demonstrated over and over again in countless studies. In 1995, there was a study that showed that violin players had increased brain structure and regions, larger brain regions, in the areas associated with hand motions, and that this brain growth was more pronounced in people who had used the violin for longer. Similar studies have shown brain changes for those who are jugglers, those who are taxi cab drivers. And in 2006, there was even a study of medical students, and it showed that within only three months, their brains had grown in areas for learning when they were studying really hard for a big test. So in only three months, their brains had physically changed. But while learning grows the brain, pornography shrinks the brain. A 2014 study found that increased pornography use is linked to decreased brain matter in the regions of the brain associated with motivation and decision making. And in our culture, that's not the area you want to be losing brain matter. Pornography also contributes to impaired impulse control, desensitization to sexual reward, which we'll come back to. And this shrinkage was more pronounced in the heaviest pornography users. Again, very similar to the violinists that we studied earlier. And so as pornography physically changes the brain, it also conditions the brain. And it conditions the brain to become more accustomed to maybe sexual activities that they would not have originally found interesting, or even to sexual activities that they would have initially found disturbing. This can be explained by a recent research that was done of a bunch of rats where the researchers took some female rats and sprayed them with cadaverine, which is the smell of rotting flesh. And rats really don't like this smell. They usually run away from it. So he sprayed the females with this smell, and then he brought in some young male virgin rats and had them mate. Later on, a few days later, he put some unscented females and some females who were smelling like rotting flesh in an environment with these young males, and they mated indiscriminately with both. But males, male rats that did not have previous sexual experience that was conditioning their brain to the smell of rotting flesh ran away from the females that had that smell. Versus the males that did have previous sexual experience that conditioned their brain to the smell of rotting flesh, they would even play with toys that were sprayed with cadaverine. Whereas again, the males who were not conditioned ran away from those toys. And we see that pornography is conditioning the brain um, to very violent material, which we'll discuss later. Pornography is also making the brain susceptible to escalation and addiction. A 2015 MRI study from Cambridge found that compulsive sexual behavior is characterized by novelty seeking, conditioning, 
and habituation to sexual stimuli in males, meaning that the user needs more extreme content over time in order to achieve the same level of arousal. This is something that is a hallmark of addiction, this escalating need for more extreme content or larger quantities of the content. Why does this happen? Dopamine. Dopamine has a lot of functions, um, such as measuring re reward value, motivation, learning memory, and sexual desire, and it's stimulated by novelty. In the past, this made so much sense. It's a way for us to make sure that we aren't inbreeding, make sure that we are going out and trying new things um, in the caveman days. So we're looking for novelty all the time in our human brain, thanks to dopamine. However, with internet pornography, we now have endless novelty. Um, and this makes internet pornography so different from DVD pornography or magazines because with a few clicks, you can see hundreds and thousands of people you have now sexual access to. There have been brain scans of people who are compulsively using pornography and they show that they have increased pleasure um, stimulation in their pleasure centers when watching pornography than controls, than people who don't have compulsive pornography problems. And this is similar to drug addicts. Um, this is actually almost directly similar to heroin addicts in the ways that they have an increased anticipation as their dopamine spikes are conditioned to pornography and they're looking for um, what they know will come as they watch. The reason why pornography can be so addicting in addition to its novelty is the fact that it is a super normal stimulus. This is a term that was coined by a Nobel Prize winning biologist and he did a lot of experiments to explain the concept such as painting um, plaster bird eggs and cardboard butterflies. This cardboard butterflies experiment was probably my favorite because he took these large butterfly wings that were larger and more colorful than anything that could be found in nature, very akin to what we see in pornography. And when he put them in the habitat with the butterflies, all of the butterflies went to go mate with the cardboard butterflies instead of the real butterflies. This is happening in our world with pornography and as Naomi Wolf said, for the first time in human history, the image's power and allure have surplanted that of real women. Today, real women are just bad porn. Going on to the harms of pornography to the body, we see that pornography use is linked to negative body image, sexually transmitted diseases, and pornography-induced sexual dysfunctions. Um, negative body image um, is happening both for men and women. In 2015, there was one study showing that they, it increases in security in men with bare muscles and increased anxiety in romantic relationships. With women, there was a study showing that they have decreased body image satisfaction and that they get criticized more often by their partners for their body type or for their sexual activities as well. Pornography is also harming sexual function of especially my generation, the millennial generation. A study of sexually active young males found that around 26% had problems with erectile function. This is dramatic when we look at the same kind of research that was done before high-speed internet was available, before high-speed pornography was available. Before high-speed pornography, people under 40 who struggled with erectile dysfunction was typically around 1%, and now we're at 26%. Surveys find that 20% of male porn users say that one motive for their pornography use is in order to just maintain arousal with a partner. They also found that pornography use was linked to higher sexual desire, but lower sexual satisfaction, which is a hallmark of pornography, where you have a craving, but a dislike of what you're engaged in. Pornography is ultimately sex negative. We hear so often that pornography is what's liberating about sexuality. It's empowering. It's a way to engage with your sexuality, to learn more. But what we're finding is not only is it harming individuals' body image or desire to engage romantically with a partner, but it's also actually stopping the ability for so many people to even have sexual encounters. And it's ultimately sex negative. We also see that pornography is very much linked to sexual violence in a variety of ways. Pornography teaches that women enjoy sexual violence. There was one study done um, a few years ago on popular pornography of the time that found that 
of pornographic scenes featured violence against women, and 95% of those, in, in those scenes, the women responded either neutrally or with pleasure, which is literally sending a message to anyone who watches it that women enjoy sexual violence. And how does this happen? How does this start to then impact the way people act? That's explained by something called cognitive script theory which is a theory that says that media provides a heuristic learning model outlining what we should do, how people will react, and what the outcome of our actions should be. This isn't actually that complicated. I remember when I was a kid, I would watch this show called Recess. I don't know if any of you ever remember it, but basically the entire show was about elementary school students that would get into trouble, be complete brats, disrespect authority, and my mom didn't let me watch it because she thought that I would start to act like those kids as the more that I watched it. Because I thought, oh, that's what kids are supposed to be like and everyone will laugh and think it's funny. So that's kind of a harmless example, right? A kid watching a cartoon. But when you look at pornography and the kind of cementation that happens when sexual stimuli and release is um, associated with that, then the lessons that people are learning from the media that they're watching is cemented in their brains more so than any simple cartoon. Pornography is associated with sexual offenses and accepting rape myths. This study clearly shows that, um, that what I'm talking about is happening. A meta-analysis of 46 different studies, which is one of the most um, rigorous academic kind of studies you can have, found that pornographic material was a clear and consistent with accepting rape myths. Rape myths are things like believing that a woman might deserve to be raped because of what she's wearing, or that women enjoy rape, and with increased risk of committing sexual offenses themselves. Ultimately, pornography lies. It says that women are tools to be used, and that men are inevitable predators, that naturally, if you are a man, you must want to act this way towards a woman. And I believe that we deserve better than the lies that pornography is telling us about our sexuality. Pornography is linked to increased verbal and physical aggression. Another meta-analysis, again, very strong <coughs> research of 22 studies from seven different countries, this is not just an American phenomenon, found that internationally the consumption of pornography was significantly associated with increases in verbal and physical aggression. And we're seeing this even just from male, male pornography users' testimonies themselves. One male who's 20 years old wrote that he gradually became desensitized and escalated to more extreme, brutal, and degrading videos. He said, that hurts me even more because I'm a sensitive and empathetic person and would never want anyone to suffer, especially not girls or women in real life. It is devastating and cruel to see how you get accustomed to practices you would naturally find disgusting and inhumane. And that again points us back to the neuroscience and the way that with those rats, they became accustomed to the smell of rotting flesh because their sexual experiences, their sexual templates were merged with those smells. And the same thing is happening here where sexual violence, most 14 year olds or 11 year olds or nine year olds, when they go and they search for pornography or they are accidentally exposed to it online, they're not expecting to see pornography where 88% of the scenes contain violence against women. That's not what they're looking for. But the pornography industry, this profit-driven industry, is reaching out and telling them that that's what they need to be watching in order to be a man, and that that's what real men want out of their sexuality. And so we're seeing that their men's sexual templates are really being corrupted and um, stolen from them by the pornography industry and what they're putting out there. And another um, boy wrote that he would play out violent fantasies at school of what he would do with different girls, and that this was all happening before 14 years old. We also see that in the realm of sexual violence, pornography fuels the demand for sexual exploitation in other ways as well. An analysis of 101 sex buyers found that sex buyers used pornography more frequently than those who did not go out and purchase another individual, and they reported that their sexual preferences changed, um, they escalated, they were conditioned, so that they sought more violent and risky forms of sex. And we see this in other ways as well. Sex traffickers are making pornography of their victims, because while you can only sell one person one time, um, 
in, in maybe a given hour or a given time span, you can sell the same video over and over and over again. And we see also that sex traffickers, abusive partners, will use pornography as a way to extort a person um, to say that they have to do something in order to earn back the video or earn back the photo. So we see that pornography is linked to all of these other forms of sexual exploitation, and that's for a different conversation, but you should be aware of those connections. And if you want to learn more about specifically the link between pornography and sex trafficking, you can go to stoptraffickingdemand.com. Also, it's important to remember that women and men are exploited in the pornography industry itself. There is a recent study from the New York Academy of Medicine that found that, that did an in-depth survey and interviews with pornography performers in Los Angeles. And it found that so many of them had experienced physical trauma while on set that they frequently um, left the industry with fiscally insecure without making a lot of money, and that they were regularly exposed to substance abuse and other harms as well. One male, oops, one male pornography performer is quoted as saying, if the women were completely sober, no alcohol, no drugs, I guarantee you, most of them would probably have mental breakdowns. And this is from someone who's actively engaged in the pornography industry, just sharing what the experience is like for the performers involved. Individuals who are in pornography have nearly double the rate of depression as compared to the general population, nearly double the rate of having lived in poverty as compared to the normal population, and have, I don't know, it's close to three times, not quite three times, close to three times a rate of being a victim of past sexual abuse. So it's important to recognize that even if one person is watching it and they're okay with their own sexual templates being distorted because they think they might not go out and harm someone else, by even just watching these videos, they are engaging in and promoting the profiting from another person's sexual exploitation who is vulnerable and could be looking for um, help or some kind of livelihood. So what can we do? <laughs> this is a lot of really depressing information. Um, unfortunately, this is only skimming the top of the research of the harms of pornography. Um, but there are things that we can do in order to make a difference. One of those things is passing resolutions that declare pornography a public health crisis. This is something that has been done in four states already. It is passed in Utah, um, South Dakota, Arkansas, and most recently, Tennessee. These are non-binding non resolutions that simply help raise awareness in each state about the harms of pornography and therefore help um, parents be more alerted to the harms. And so that, that's something that you can do if you're interested in engaging on a state policy level. We also have a dirty dozen list at the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, where we name and shame 12 mainstream contributors to sexual exploitation. These are companies that we invite into our homes, that we trust, um, but they often are actually profiting from either pornography or sex trafficking. So if you can give this list a quick look, you can learn more at dirtydozenlist.com. And if you go there, you can take some direct actions where you can email the executives at Twitter, where you can sign petitions about Amnesty International, where you can share graphics about HBO or Roku. So that's a great way to even if you're just at home and just have an internet connection, you can reach out and make a direct difference. And this has actually been extremely successful in the past. In the last 18 months, we got four major hotels, uh, Hilton Worldwide, Starwood, Intercontinental Hotels Group, and Hilton um, and Hyatt Hotels and Resorts to stop selling hardcore pornography through their hotels. This, uh, this amounts to about two million hotel rooms that now do not have pornography being sold through them. And Hilton Worldwide executives reached out to us after they were on our Dirty Dozen list and said, hey, we're getting a thousand emails a week from your supporters through this list. What do we need to do to get off of your list? And then we gave them the solution and they were willing to take action. So this does get results. So I definitely recommend that you um, get involved here. You can also share resources, both just your personal help to friends or family members that you know who are struggling 
But um, also we have some resources at endsexualexploitation.org slash resources. And that, those are resources for parents, those are resources for people who are trying to stop watching pornography, and for people whose spouses or boyfriends or girlfriends are watching pornography. Um, so these are some great things that you can share. You can also come to our summit, which is this coming April in DC out near Dulles. And it's a great way to get involved with the movement. Um, we're expecting hundreds of leaders. This is, will be our fourth summit. And it's a great way to get involved because you not only learn about the harms of pornography, but you also learn about the harms of sex trafficking, sexual violence, child sexual abuse, and also solutions. And most people who are there are leaders. So it's a great way to get involved, get plugged in, and to find a group that you want to either volunteer your time with or potentially join it in a more formal capacity. So pornography is the new tobacco, it's the new cigarettes, but that's actually good news. Because in the 1950s, cigarettes were pervasive. Everybody thought it was normal, everybody thought it was glamorous. But soon, public opinion changed. Research and public opinion started pushing back. And people started recognizing that this was harmful, so they took a public health model approach. It was interdisciplinary, it was widespread. They had doctors, they had lawyers, they had college students, everyone gathering together in order to make a difference. And uh, the problem with the public health approach is that we all need to be involved for it to work. Not one piece of legislation is going to solve this issue. Not one social enterprise is going to solve this issue. Not one person, but all of us together. And luckily there is this growing coalition, which is gathering at the summit here in DC in April, that is working on this. And so this is something that we can see a lot of success and victory from. So that's all that I had for today. Um, we would be happy to answer any of your questions, but thank you so much for coming here, and I hope that together we can take a stand and push back against the pornography industry. Thank you. Questions? Does anybody in the audience have a question? Yes. I'm just going to ask you if you could comment on um, if there's any research or data out there that talks about increasing pornography uses among women, because I've heard that a lot more people have talked about that becoming more normal in middle school age girls and into high school, um, and just the desensitizing of both sexes to sexual images of other people. So, do you have a comment on that? Do you have any studies on that? Yes. Yeah. Um, so, his question was. Do we have any studies or um, knowledge about rising female pornography use? And definitely, not only anecdotal stories, that's mostly what's coming in right now. There have been a few studies that have shown that especially women 25 and under have, are more likely to watch pornography than older generations. I think this is largely just due to high-speed internet. Um, it's there are pop-ups, there's so many ways that people can um, see it there, but also through erotica literature, the way that we're seeing a lot of women initially get into pornography through that and then later in with videos. Yeah. Do you have anything to add? I don't have anything to add to that. That was a perfect answer. <laughs> Any other questions? No questions? Okay. Yes. Sorry, I was going to for my next question, you kind of already brought it up, but I was going to ask what you think about like the trend of erotic literature becoming popular movies nowadays as far as in mainstream on Valentine's Day with a lot of lines for cliches and all of that, like what you see that as a trend or how that's helping or harming, um, yeah. obviously harming, but. <laughs> yeah, the, um, the, the asked a question about erotica literature, the rising trend, and especially as we see in Fifty Shades of Grey, how that came into the movie theaters as well. I do see that as a rising trend um, and a particularly disturbing one, especially with Themes like Fifty Shades of Grey, which absolutely normalizes and actually glamorizes what is actually a domestic abuse relationship. And we had an entire campaign on that called Fifty Dollars, Not Fifty Shades, and Fifty Shades is Abuse. So you can actually go to our website and um, learn more about that campaign. Would you have anything else to say about that? <laughs> <laughs> really, you're not putting out the park, really. I don't know if I really need to, to add to that. You, you're, you're hitting all home runs here. Any more questions? Yes. Once the resolution has passed in the states, what's the next step? What, where do they take it from there? What's the next step after a state passes a public health resolution? 
That's a great question. You know, we're, we're not dictating that. It's very much a grassroots effort. We're not the ones that are going into each state and leading the efforts. It's really, as you know, people in the state who care about the issues, who want to bring it forward. Often what I say is potentially looking at making sure that schools have, and public libraries have adequate filters, making sure that their online lab library databases that are used for curriculum online are clean of pornography as well. Um, there are a lot of existing laws regarding that, but they are typically not enforced very well. So pr my personal opinion would be that after a state passes that resolution, looking at making sure their schools and public libraries um, are safe is the next natural next step. But would you have a different idea? Um, the only thing I would add to that would be to say that we, we really see the public health resolutions as laying the groundwork as a springboard for which people can then use that as leverage to further um, efforts to um, you know, identify what the gaps are in their state and figure out what's the best way to move forward to create more protections in the law. Uh, but in terms of the National Center on Sexual Exploitation, we haven't formulated a specific agenda yet, but we're reaching out to groups and asking for ideas. Uh, so and we welcome your ideas, Peggy, or those from any of the people of our audience mm -hmm. that you know have suggestions in terms of public policy initiatives that we could adopt uh, at the state level to help push back against this toxic tide of pornography. So but thank you for raising the question. Yes. <laughs> Can you talk about some of the legal strategies to combating pornography, aside from like the resolutions which are non-binding, maybe particularly federal obscenity law? Yeah, so other legal solutions beyond the non-binding resolution would be federal obscenity law. What Something that most people don't recognize is obscenity, which is um, typically considered hardcore pornography, is actually illegal under federal law to be distributed among hotels, motels, retail stores, internet, um, and more. And these laws just haven't been enforced for close to 10 years now, which is one reason why we're actually experiencing this public health crisis in the first place, is because now pornography distribution has not been, um, has not been prosecuted. And so we definitely want the Department of Justice to begin prosecuting obscenity law again in order to, uh, in order to help be one, one piece to fixing the public health crisis. Yes, and in that regard, um, we have developed a campaign that the, pe that the public can join to help create a, a, a push uh, and, and encourage the Department of Justice to relaunch obscenity uh, prosecutions. And uh, the name of that campaign, Haley, is? Um, Defend Justice, Prosecute Illegal Pornographers. And you can learn more about it at endsexualexploitation.org slash DOJ. And this is why she's our director of communications. <laughs> I just have the URLs memorized. <laughs> she's outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, so please check out our website, check out that URL, and take action and write the Department of Justice and encourage them to begin prosecuting not just child pornography, but all of obscenity. And actually, you can also um, visit our website because just a couple weeks ago, uh, Mr. Truman, our president, gave a presentation on the issue of obscenity law enforcement. And we have a paper that he wrote on this issue on our website, and we also have an obscenity law fact sheet. So these are some great resources to help you uh, learn to understand and learn more about obscenity law enforcement. And if you want more um, research that I wasn't able to cover here, you can go to endsexualexploitation.org slash public health. Um, we have a lot of blogs there, a lot of video presentations from credentialed experts, and also some peer-reviewed research summaries. Mm -hmm. but one time all. for one last question. Yes, Linda. Is, uh, are these um, videos from this summer, from this, this series, are they going to be available on your website for? Yes, yeah, on our events page. So the question was, um, yeah, so the, the question was, would these videos uh, from these presentations be available on our website? Yes. And <laughs> <laughs> um, sexualexploitation.org slash events, or if you just go to our page um, and click projects, click events, and these will be there. All right, well, thank you so much, Haley. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Thank you guys out there for tuning in. And come back next Thanks week. Thanks on Facebook.
I'll be um, commenting in the comments. If you have any questions, let me know. I'll be happy to answer. Bye.